Yeah, Gunner Sergeant Arlie Ermey here. Listen up. On this episode of Lock and Load, it is all about field artillery. Once upon a time, the best we could do was chuck rocks at our enemies. Now we hurl 100-pound warheads through the bad guy's front door from 20 miles away. Look at that! All right! And this here's how we did I'm going to show you how blowing things up became an exact science. And how, over the centuries, we just keep getting better at it. It's amazing what field artillery can do these days. Three, two, one! If that doesn't clear your sinuses, I don't know what will. It's time for lock and load! So just what exactly is field artillery? Well, keep your shirt on, because I'm getting there. Now, the word artillery applies to any contraption meant to hurl a large projectile from point A to point B. Now, back in ancient times, artillery came mainly in the form of machines like catapults. Around since 400 BC, this artillery mainly hurls huge rocks at fortresses. But artillery got a big upgrade with the development of the cannon. Kaboom! A cannon is basically a tube with deadly intentions. Inside, there's a projectile. Behind that is gunpowder. Light it, and the explosive force shoots out the projectile. It was first developed back in the 1200s by those gunpowder gurus, the Chinese. Gunpowder cannons caught on in Europe in the 13th and 14th century. The first European cannons were made out of cast iron and fired stone cannonballs that were loaded down the barrel after you loaded your gunpowder. This, my little darlings, is called the charge. Bingo. It wasn't long before cannons of all shapes and sizes were popping up all over the place. Thunder sticks that were mobile enough to be moved around the battlefields quickly became known as, you got it, field artillery, which can be broken down into three basic types. The gun, a long-barreled weapon with a generally flat trajectory. The howitzer, its shorter barrel can be angled to change the flight trajectory. Finally, we have the mortar. It has a very short barrel and fires rounds at extremely steep angles. Well, you got that? Wonderful. You're finally keeping up with me for a change. I'm proud of you. The first piece of field artillery we're going to look at was used back around the time that the good old U.S. of A. was getting started. 1776. Three-pound gun. Range, 400 yards. Bore, 2.9 inches. This is the three-pounder. It may be small and cute, but these little fellows helped George Washington and the boys win the Revolutionary War. In battle, they can be wheeled into place quickly and fired at the enemy troops or barricades. To get the idea of the damage three-pounders can do, I'm hooking up with war reenactor Bob Hayes, who likes staging battles the old-fashioned way. You know, Bob, it's a really nice-looking little cannon, and loading it's got to be a walk in the park. I mean, you know, a little thing like this. It's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, right. <laughs> complicated. How complicated could it be? <laughs> Come on. Turns out it's pretty complicated. First, we use the worm to clear any embers or debris. Number two, the wet sponge is put down the bore. The sponge cleans the bore and puts out any hot embers missed by the worm. And for safety, we use a second sponge, which is a damp sponge. Any little spark and the darn thing might just go off before you're ready. We still haven't got the powder yet. Well, the round is then placed in the muzzle. The gunpowder's in the foil package. 
Now, back in 1776, it would have been in a linen bag. Then we're ready to go. No, it has to be pushed down the barrel or rammed home before we can fire it. Then we make a hole in the powder bag with a vent prick. Insert a fuse. Then we grab what's called the slow match. Mrs. Gunny can get ready faster than this gun. Yes, but uh, Mrs. Gunny doesn't feel kill 15 men with one shot. He hadn't met Mrs. Gunny. Unlike us, a battle-hardened crew takes only 30 seconds to fire this three-pounder. Firing at this big wooden target is going to show you just why Washington's army found this gun so useful. Oh, yeah, good to go. Now, we're going to do my favorite part. Yes, sir. Three, two, one. Look at that! All right, victory! Just above the bullseye, we're in the nine ring. That's good enough for anybody. I'm liking it. A three-pound cannonball could take out 15 men. That is, if they happen to be queued up in a nice straight line, like in a typical infantry formation of the time. But sometimes that just ain't enough. When you absolutely, positively need more destruction, what do you do? Get bigger balls. <laughs> Time for the next step, 1841, six pound gun. Range, 1,500 yards. Bore, 3.67 inches. By 1846 in the Mexican-American War, the American military had kicked three pound guns to the curb and was all in with a six pounder. Why? Well, not only is the ball bigger, but the six pounder has a barrel length of 65 inches. That'd be five and a half feet. Compare that with the dinky little 42 inch barrel of the three pounder. That's just three and a half feet. So what? Well, the longer the barrel, the greater the accuracy and muzzle velocity. That's the speed the cannon spits out the ball, couch potatoes. You see, for any given amount of gunpowder, the explosive force only pushes the ball forward while it's actually inside the barrel. Longer barrel, faster cannonball, more range, power, and accuracy. Got it? Good. The six pounder is still an old school muzzle loader, but it comes with another important innovation. It's the first field artillery piece with proper sights, meaning improved accuracy. And then there's this huge ball, which causes... a big hole. When you were trying to punch a hole in a wall, the cannonball was pretty good. But big old balls weren't the only thing that came out of the end of the barrel. Another type of ammo is called grape shot, a cluster of smaller balls that spread out in a wide arc hitting more men. And that's just what General Zachary Taylor employed back in 1847 when he ran smack bang into 20,000 Mexican soldiers. Then Taylor gave his famous order. A little more grape, Captain Bragg. Double shot your guns and give them hell. And he's talking about a double dose of grape shot. You didn't want to be anywhere near these things when they start shooting at you. Today, we're using ammo similar to that used in the Mexican-American War. It's called canister. We're going one better than General Taylor. We're loading triple canister to show you the effects on one of my favorite targets. The melons are about 150 feet away. May I, please? A deadly range for canister. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. OK, boys. Ready to fire.
Boy, that looks good, don't it? Mmm. <laughs> Firing canister, the six pounder did more than destroy troops. It also dampened enemy morale. The sweet taste of victory. When we come back, the guns are going to get bigger, and it is going to get nasty. We're talking field artillery here. The three and six pounders played a big part in early American history. But they're cumbersome, and were only really effective at short range. Time for a breakthrough. Every once in a while, a cannon comes along that just makes you want to say, C'est magnifique. In 1857, a new gun emerged that would revolutionize artillery and the way it was used in battle. The Napoleon. 1857. 12-pound Napoleon. Range, 1,700 yards. Bore, 4.62 inches. The Napoleon fires the biggest projectile we've seen yet, a 12-pound cannonball. And its barrel measures a hefty 72 inches long, compared to 65 for the six-pounder and only 42 inches for the three. Remember, a longer barrel means better accuracy, higher muzzle velocity, and more impact. The Napoleon wasn't named after the little corporal. It was named after his nephew, Napoleon III. And that's all we give a damn about him. But there are some people who really care about Napoleon cannons. A team of reenactors led by Charlie Smithgall who likes things blown apart. Kind of like me. The predecessor to this gun, the barrel weighed around 1,770 pounds, and they redesigned it that this one would weigh around 1,200 pounds, taking 500 pounds out of the gun. That means you can carry about 500 pounds more ammo. The reason this gun weighs less is simple. It's made out of bronze, not iron. As you might know, bronze is an alloy made out of copper and tin, but it ain't cheap. So during the Civil War, the side with the most cash to spend on bronze has the most Napoleons. That side would be the North. The reason I understand that the North won the war was because the South didn't have as many of these. Didn't have as many and didn't have the materials to make them. During the war, of course, this was generally fired at the enemy. Today, we're firing that 12-pound cannonball at four steel drums full of water, representing a squad of infantry enemy. We're going to blow this baby up Napoleon style. Should beat that center bull. a mess of steel down there. I thought maybe it'd go through two barrels full of water. It went into this one, opened it up. The second barrel wide open. Third the barrel third wide barrel, open. The fourth barrel it went through. The Napoleon's brute strength is confirmed by the slow-mo replay. Now that ripple is actually a shock wave, which means that cannonball has broken the sound barrier. This gun has a muzzle velocity of 1,485 feet per second. That's a tick over 1,000 miles an hour. 
but that massive force causes the gun to jump backwards. It's called recoil. Problem is, now you have to reposition and re-aim the gun all over again. That was a big headache for cannon cockers in the day. So bigger is better, right? Well, not so fast, Powderheads. The Civil War arms race quickly led to a gun that could do damage like this, but was actually smaller, lighter, and easier to maneuver. It had a revolutionary barrel design and used a new kind of ammunition. Well, it was called the Parrot Gun. Ooh, yeah. 1861, 20-pound Parrot Gun. Range, 2,000 yards. Bore, 3.67 inches. It was Robert Parrott's revolutionary rifled barrel that really got cannons into the groove. Now listen up, in case you don't know what rifling is, it's the spiral lands and grooves in the bore of the gun that causes the projectile to spin through the air, dunderheads. So it flies straighter and further. But if you want to rifle a cannon like a bronze Napoleon, you run into problems because bronze is too soft and the grooves wear out too quick. So first they tried cast iron. Well, that was too brittle. In 1861, Yankee Captain Robert Parrott has a stroke of genius. He wraps a wrought iron band around the base of the cast iron barrel, giving it more strength. And the best news, because it's not bronze, it cost half as much as a Napoleon. And Bobby Parrott gives cannon cockers more bang for their buck in the firepower department. He designs the first cone-shaped shell, a longer projectile and heavier than the clumsy old cannonball. The newly designed Parrott gun shot further and was more accurate than any other gun that came before it. Not bad for a guy with a funny last name like Parrot. Let's see how it compares to the Napoleon. Same target, same distance. A 20-pound projectile versus a 12-pound cannonball. One gun is named after a French emperor, and the other one is named after a talking bird. Okay, boys, those barrels are dead meat. The enemy's in our sight. Load! For all its innovation, you still gotta load it the old-fashioned way. One stray spark inside that barrel while you're ramming in the charge, and this parrot goes the same way as the dodo. All right, ready? The Parrot has a lot more muzzle velocity because the projectile is designed to fit the rifle's grooves exactly. There's no gap, so no wasted energy. It leaves the barrel even faster than the Napoleon's cannonball. But more importantly, it maintains its accuracy and velocity. Charlie, this is amazing stuff. This is even, we've done more damage to these four barrels than we did to the other one. It just penetrates much more. But the Parrot does have one disadvantage compared to the Napoleon. Because it's rifled, it can't fire grape shot or canister balls anymore. But if you want a fortress knockdown, Bobby Parrot's your man. We've had a good look at some quality straight shooters. When we come back, we're gonna lob some high ones with a different type of Civil War artillery, the mortar. Don't even think about moving.
Now, if you've been paying attention, then you know the term field artillery applies to any type of cannon that's mobile enough to be used on the battlefield. What if you wanted to shoot high and over something instead of just shooting straight ahead? Well, then you'd need a different type of artillery bullet head. You'd need a mortar. A mortar is a short cannon that lobs ammo at high trajectories. It was mainly used for getting a projectile over high fortress walls. We call that indirect fire. Like straight shooting cannons, they've been around since the Middle Ages. But they weighed several tons, so they weren't too mobile. But one version was about to be a real game changer in the Civil War. During the siege of Vicksburg in 1863, General Ulysses S. Grant used huge borders for 47 days and nights to break down Confederate morale. In Vicksburg, Mississippi, they still use this in the center of a dartboard to this day. But Grant's big mortars weighed more than seven tons, so they were pretty darn tough to lug around the battlefield. In battle, mobility is the name of the game, and both sides turned to their smaller mortars, the 24-pounder. 1862, 24-pound Cohorn mortar. Range, 1,200 yards. Bore, 5.82 inches. Named after the guy who invented it, a Dutchman, Baron Van Cohorn, this 180-pound mortar could be carried by just a crew of four men. This Cohorn belongs to Tony Baris, a Civil War reenactor born about 150 years too late. So how much powder are you gonna put in there? Well, it takes approximately a half ounce to nine ounces, depending on how far you want the ball to go. So the powder charge decides the distance or the range. Exactly. Today, we're going to lob a 17-pound ball onto that target over there. Now, just imagine it's an enemy stronghold. You get the idea. Over the years, if there's one damn thing that I've learned in a wartime condition situation, you cannot order up the kind of weather that you want. You got cold in Korea. You got monsoon rains in, in Vietnam. Well, out here in the Colorado Desert, we got 40 mile an hour winds. Does that bother us? Does that stop us? Hell no! We have an enemy bunker out there, a fortification we need to blow out of this desert, and we're gonna do it. Tony, get your butt up here and let's get it done. Now, it's gonna be a little tricky aiming this thing today because you line it up with a plumb bob that's supposed to hang nice and level. I'm using the string as a sight between the vent, the top of the barrel, and the target downrange. <laughs> yeah, under ideal conditions, that is. Piece is sighted. Ready to fire. Tony, I feel good about this one, buddy. Three, two, one. We want to go through the roof. That's what we want to do. Lock and load, gentlemen, let's go. Unlike a straight shooting cannon, the force from a mortar shot is mostly transferred into the ground, which means less movement. So once you dial in your target, you spend less time resetting after each shot. That means faster shooting and more hits. Tony? When this cannonball goes through the roof of that bunker, I expect to see some celebration going on here. You got it? Three, two, one. Golden hit, yeah! So there you have it. If you want to go up and over, the mortar is the tool for the job. 
But with the Industrial Revolution comes a whole new generation of artillery. Easier to load, greater range, more accuracy, and that's not all. The thing that really made everybody jump back was the development of the recoil mechanism. 1881. Mark 12 one-pounder. Yeah. Range, two miles. Bore, 1.65 inches. This little gun represents three major improvements in post-Civil War cannon technology. First, instead of a ball and separate powder charge, it has a self-contained shell. I like that. This is one of the shells that the Mark 12 shot. And believe me, it definitely left its mark. Next, it's a breech loader. You put the shell in the rear of the gun. No more ramming it down the barrel. And finally, there's one more big innovation. But I'll let Rick Polers, proud owner of this Mark 12 here, tell you all about it. Rick, this gun represents a huge leap in technology. What about this part of it? This is called the recuperator. It arrests the recoil of the gun. The energy is transmitted down to the shovel here. So the whole system stays in place. Technology at its finest. The Mark 12 uses what's called a hydro spring recoil mechanism. This means that the recoil from each shot is absorbed by the gun. And that means for the first time ever, you can hit the same precise target over and over again without moving the gun. Gunpowder, I need, I need to smell that beautiful smell of gunpowder. So let's rock and roll, let's shoot it. Okay. Okay, looking through the rear sight aperture, over the front sight blade. Oh, looks to me like we're zeroed in pretty good, Rick. All right, let's rock and roll. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Well, look at that. We got a bullseye. Yes. That recoil mechanism seems to do the job. The proof will be in the second shot. Well, let's test that theory now that you don't have to realign it. Let's see if it really works. Three, two, one. Well, they're really close together, Rick, so I'm, I'm amazed now. That's some good shooting there. Yeah, looks like two eyeballs, don't it? Guns like the Mark 12 change the face of field artillery. Because you can drop more rounds more quickly on the same spot. But recoil-absorbing guns are about to get a serious facelift. Well, we've covered a lot of ground with field artillery so far. Hold on tight while I bring you up to speed. Early style cannons like the three and six pound field guns play a big part in American history. Helping us to win the revolution and Mexican-American wars. By the time the Civil War rolled around, field artillery was more mobile and reached further. Cannons like the Napoleon and the Parrot Gun helped the North win. Thanks to the Industrial Revolution, artillery design made some big advancements. It was getting easier to load, and with recoil under control, it was more accurate more often. Time now to leap to a new century and a new type of artillery. All right, kiddies, it's time for your next lesson. It's all about the howitzer. It's a type of cannon that can be angled to shoot different trajectories. Its big strength is that it's versatile. It can be a straight shooting gun, 
a high lobbing mortar, or anything in between. And one little howitzer in particular represents a breakthrough in the battlefield. 1927, M1A1, pack howitzer. Range, 9,760 yards. Bore, 75 millimeter. When it comes to field artillery, mobility is everything. And that's where the PAC-75 comes out on top. The gun and its carriage break down into parts that can be carried in packs by mules. Hence the name. It's the first artillery piece that can be delivered where it's needed by parachute. The airborne divisions ate it up. The Pac-75 got a slice of the action in the Battle of the Bulge. At Bastogne, it took out eight enemy tanks, helping to win the battle. Now, if you know anything about the Battle of the Bulge, then you'll know that it was really cold. Even the squirrels had trouble keeping their nuts warm. So in a tribute to Bastogne, gun collector Bob McBride picks one hell of a Colorado morning to show me how the pack works. What was the uh, desired targets? Mostly buildings, observation posts, uh, infantry in the open, occasionally tanks. And it packs a hell of a punch, too. That's correct. This thing is going to really light up the target down there when we hit it. Where is the target down there? I can't oh, hardly it, see it. Well, it's somewhere down there in the snow. Well, what I think we should do is go ahead and shoot the damn thing. All right, why don't we do that? Yeah. Okay, we're going to load it. Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. Three, two, one. All you lounge lizards out there in your nice, comfy armchairs better appreciate the lengths that we're going to to recreate the Battle of the Bulge. You hit something. I, I heard, heard it hit. hit. I heard it hit, too. That's definitely a kill shot, Gunny. We definitely got him. Field howitzers like the Pac-75 have served our boys well. But today's howitzer is a lot bigger and a lot smarter. 2005 M777 Field Howitzer. Range up to 25 miles. Bore 155 millimeter. Fire mission! Fire mission! This weapon has solutions for every problem that field artillery has ever faced. Shell H-E! Shell H-E! It's made out of titanium, one of the lightest and toughest metals around. Deflection tree two five five. Deflection tree two five five. At just over 9,000 pounds, the Trip 7's a breeze to tow behind a truck, making it extremely mobile. Usually crewed by seven men, it is still breech-loaded manually. Stand by. What? Fire! But here's the big breakthrough. No one can hide from it. It's the first smart gun using GPS to lock onto any target within its 25 mile range. I want you to meet Staff Sergeant Eric Lewinsky. I hear that uh, this is so high tech that it's almost intelligent. It is to a certain degree. Uh, uh still needs that human factor to help load and fire it gunny but for the most part it is a very intelligent weapon system it knows where it's at and where it's going to fire. even though the new trip seven is cutting edge there's no question about top of the line there's some things that never change and it's this right here There you go. They still have to swab it out each and every time before they stick that next powder bag in there. 
To lob a shell at a bad guy on the other side of a mountain range, you need some eyes up front. That would be the forward observer. He relays coordinates to the command center. It tells the gun crew the coordinates, the elevation, the type of brown, the charge, and how many rounds to shoot. There is absolutely no guesswork with today's artillery. Let's say we kill something, Staff Sergeant. Hoorah, Gunny. Stand by. Fire! Fire! Steel downrange, that's what it's all about. Of course, this is only a practice. But in the heat of battle, these Marines can get up to eight rounds a minute downrange. Its single 155 millimeter high explosive projectile will take out bunkers, bridges, small buildings, and any damn thing else you want took out downrange with no mistakes. And that's a very big change. Hoorah! Right. As a piece of field artillery, the M Trip 7 might seem darn near perfect. But even something as sweet as this still has one major drawback. It takes a whole 20 minutes to pack up and go. That's a heck of a long time for the Trip 7 crew to be setting ducks. It would be a darn sight safer if it could just shoot and scoot. There used to be an old TV show called Hab Gun Will Travel. This next piece of artillery has a gun and it travels just fine under its own power. It's called self-propelled artillery. The present Paladin self-propelled howitzer. Range 19 miles. Bore 155 millimeter. Like the lead character in that old show, it's named after legendary French warriors, the Paladin Knights of Charlemagne. This Paladin may look like a tank, may move like a tank, but don't be fooled, it isn't a tank. Tanks are designed to go into the heart of the battle, working up close and personal. The Paladin is a long-range artillery piece through and through. She's not a frontline weapon, but she doesn't have to be. Her range keeps her in the rear, but the Paladin provides exactly the kind of heavy fire support that every dog face loves to have at his back. I'm meeting up with Lieutenant Colonel Terry Ivester. He handles a Paladin better than Mrs. Gunny handles a car. Sorry, hon. The maximum range of this weapon system is 30 kilometers, reaching out and putting warheads onto the enemy's foreheads. See, that's the maximum effective range? Every time I shoot Gunny, it's effective. I like that. <laughs> oh, yes. The Paladin is fully networked. It receives target information from the command center, which is fed directly into the onboard computer. Like the M777, the Paladin fires a 155mm round and is GPS assisted. But that's where the comparison ends. This howitzer has the capability of keeping up with the maneuver forces. Should they make contact with the enemy and we have to conduct an indirect fire mission, we stop. We fire on the target, and then before the enemy can even acquire our rounds, we got the, the gun tube and travel lock, and we're moving, catching back up with the forces. Cruising along at a zippy 35 miles an hour, the Paladin has the speed and mobility to get away from return fire. But now that you know a little bit about this weapon system, Gunny, how would you like to take it for a ride and let's shoot some missions? You know, that's exactly what I was going to come around to asking you about, but I was a little shy. I'm just a shy individual. I, what I really like to do is I like to cruise around and blow sh stuff up, you know? For all its high-tech GPS computer-assisted targeting and fire control, fire mission! Fire mission! the Paladin is breech-loaded the same good old-fashioned way, by hand. Every time you fire around, the enemy can zero in on your position and fire back. So you don't want to waste a lot of time getting the heck out of Dodge. The Paladin can throw metal at the enemy and be gone in 60 seconds. Remember how only a couple of hundred years ago a three-pound cannon had a range of 400 yards? This baby can strike a target nearly 20 miles away. Now that is 88 times further. 
But if you thought the self-propelled Paladin was the last word in this kind of firepower, have I got a big surprise for you. Time for a sneak peek at the future of field artillery. A weapon that takes human error out of the firing equation. There's a system so new, it's still got the tags on it. The non-line-of-sight cannon. 2012, non-line-of-sight cannon. Range, 25 miles. Bore, 155 millimeter. Hitting a battlefield near you in 2012, the NLOSC, as the boys at the firing range like to call it, incorporates every technological advancement ever made in field artillery. Here to introduce it at Arizona's Yuma Proving Ground is Lieutenant Colonel Bob McBay. And it's a thing of beauty. Absolutely. Now I've already shown you how the M777 and the Paladin take a whole bunch of soldiers to fire them. Well, the NLOSC has a crew of just two, cause most of the grunt work is done by computers and robots. Even the ammo is loaded by machinery. One of your guys receives a firing mission. What goes on from that point? The network sends down a fire mission to the gun, and before the crew ever even sees the mission, the gun makes the assessment with one of its computers whether or not it's got the right ammunition, it's in the right position, and can service the target. If the gun says, I'm good to go, I can fire this, it passes it to the commander of the vehicle, and he makes the final decision on firing it. Even more amazing, this gun has eyes in the skies. Combat drones, which tell the NLOSC what lies beyond its line of sight. And when it comes to firing, the NLOSC totally rewrites the rule book. It can shoot multiple rounds consecutively, changing the barrel angle and the trajectory so that the shells can all hit the target at the same time. Figure that out. And just for a little added extra oomph, it carries the Excalibur, a rocket-propelled smart shell with its own GPS guidance system. Because it's a prototype, I don't get to ride in it. But I do get to let off a few rounds by remote control from the Mission HQ. Three, two, one! All right, now that's what I call good old American ingenuity. Firepower, destruction at its finest. Absolutely, good job, guys. Huh? Hoorah, Semper Fi. Artillery sure has come a long way since the Chinese invented gunpowder and the first hand cannons that could fire projectiles. Big game changes take place in the 19th century. Changes like the parrot gun with its rifled barrel. And the Mark 12's revolutionary recoil mechanism solves that old kick like a mule recoil problem. Had breech loading invented in the 1880s, and you're well on the way to delivering accurate shots again and again. In no time flat. Without these essential developments, today's advances would not be possible. Now, 220 or so years after George Washington's Patriots used field artillery to win the revolution, we have weapons so advanced they use robots to fire multiple rounds which can hit a target at 25 miles simultaneously. Well, there you have it. We have gone from shooting these little cannonballs a couple of hundred yards to hurling these 100-pound projectiles 19 miles over the horizon with pinpoint accuracy. Gunnery Sergeant Arlie Irby here. Keep your powder dry and your eye on the target. Dismissed.
Yeah, Gunner with Sergeant R. Lee Army here. Listen up. On this episode of Lock and Load, it is all about field artillery. Once upon a time, the best we could do was chuck rocks at our enemies. Now we hurl 100-pound warheads through the bad guy's front door from 20 miles away. Look at that! All right! And this here's how we did it. I'm going to show you how blowing things up became an exact science. And how, over the centuries, we just keep getting better at it. It's amazing what field artillery can do these days. Three, two, one! If that doesn't clear your sinuses, I don't know what will. It's time for lock and load! So just what exactly is field artillery? Well, keep your shirt on, because I'm getting there. Now, the word artillery applies to any contraption meant to hurl a large projectile from point A to point B. Now, back in ancient times, artillery came mainly in the form of machines like catapults. Around since 400 BC, this artillery mainly hurls huge rocks at fortresses. But artillery got a big upgrade with the development of the cannon. Kaboom! A cannon is basically a tube with deadly intentions. Inside, there's a projectile. Behind that is gunpowder. Light it, and the explosive force shoots out the projectile. It was first developed back in the 1200s by those gunpowder gurus, the Chinese. Gunpowder cannons caught on in Europe in the 13th and 14th century. Finally keeping up with me for a change. I'm proud of you. The first piece of field artillery we're going to look at was used back around the time that the good old U.S. of A. was getting started. 1776. Three-pound gun. Range, 400 yards. Bore, 2.9 inches. This is the three-pounder. It may be small and cute, but these little fellows helped George Washington and the boys win the Revolutionary War. In battle, they can be wheeled into place quickly and fired at the enemy troops or barricades. To get the idea of the damage three-pounders can do, I'm hooking up with war reenactor Bob Hayes, who likes staging battles the old-fashioned way. You know, Bob, it's a really nice looking little cannon and loading it's got to be a walk in the park. I mean, you know, a little thing like this. It's a little more complicated than that. The first European cannons were made out of cast iron and fired stone cannonballs that were loaded down the barrel after you loaded your gunpowder. This, my little darlings, is called a charge. Bingo. It wasn't long before cannons of all shapes and sizes were popping up all over the place. Thunder sticks that were mobile enough to be moved around the battlefields quickly became known as, you got it, field artillery, which can be broken down into three basic types. The gun, a long-barreled weapon with a generally flat trajectory. The howitzer. Its shorter barrel can be angled to change the flight trajectory. Finally, we have the mortar. It has a very short barrel and fires rounds at extremely steep angles. Well, you got that? Wonderful, you're f Yeah, right. <laughs> complicated. How complicated could it be? Come on. Turns out it's pretty complicated. First, we use the worm to clear any embers or debris. Number two, the wet sponge is put down the bore. The sponge cleans the bore and puts out any hot embers missed by the worm. And for safety, we use a second sponge, which is a damp sponge. Any little spark and the darn thing might just go off before you're ready. We still haven't got your powder yet. Well, the round is then placed in the muzzle. The gunpowder's in the foil package. 
Now, back in 1776, it would have been in a linen bag. Then we're ready to go. No, it has to be pushed down the barrel or rammed home before we can fire it. Then we make a hole in the powder bag with a vent prick. Insert a fuse. Then we grab what's called the slow match. Mrs. Gunny can get ready faster than this gun.